what I've been doing is um, we were based in Sydney when I first moved out on the northern beaches of, of Sydney and I spent sort of five months uh, in Australia, I haven't really worked out what we were going to do, we knew it would be something around working with men and boys, we tried various, um, uh, various things, but wasn't entirely sure what the focus was going to be and then just after Christmas 2015 uh, one night we were woken up by helicopters flying uh, overhead searching out at, out at sea and what we found out in the morning was that about 2am, about 3am a guy in his, his 30s had driven his car past our flat uh, through the barriers at the, at the top of the cliff and into the sea and killed himself and it was at that moment, that day I went, it's got to be male suicide uh, I've been involved in, in, in male suicide prevention in different ways in, in, the, in the UK. I've uh, had some connection with the charity, the campaign against living miserably. In fact, I think sitting at, at Calm was where I first met uh, John and uh, Martin uh, when we were working on the Year of the Male, which was a project that the uh, campaign against living miserably ran a, a few years ago. So I always have an interest in male suicide prevention. Uh, been involved over here a little bit, but not really sort of to dive deeply into the issue to really look at what, what do we need to do to actually um, address this problem. So um, I made the decision there and then that that was going to be the focus of, uh, of, of my work in Australia. And we were about to jump in, a, my partner and I were about to jump in a motorhome and travel around the country for, for 15 months. And I say country, it's a, it's a continent, it's a huge place. Uh, and I decided it'd be a, a good idea, I don't know why, to turn up in every major city uh, every state and territory around Australia and just run a, a, a seminar. Stop male suicide in Queensland, stop male suicide in, in New South Wales, stop male suicide in the Northern Territory and, 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 and so on. And just see who, who turned up and find out what, the, um, what was happening, who, were the, who, were the, who, who was working in the field, who were the academics, who were the practitioners, what could we learn by bringing people together. And the culmination of that work was uh, the first National Male Suicide Prevention Conference which we ran in Sydney uh, in, in November. And also during that time, I, I wrote a book called um, You Can Stop Male Suicide, which is a focus on some of the key steps that we can take as individuals and collectively to prevent suicide. And also developed a training for uh, community workers on, on male suicide prevention, because what I discovered was there's a lot of great training out there on how to prevent suicide, how to have a conversation with a person who's at risk of suicide. So not from a kind of working of therapeutic perspective, but what they call gatekeeper training. So people out in the community engaging with men and women who may be at risk and having that conversation about suicide and referring them on to uh, someone who could help and support. But none of that training was actually specifically focused on male suicide prevention. And as I look more into male suicide versus female suicide, you get there's a whole heap of difference, which isn't just about men being three times more likely to kill themselves. And so what we've been developing is essentially a kind of training and a leadership program, which is to identify key people and really skill them up in all the key knowledge and information that they need to take on leading the drive to reduce suicide in Australia. And, and as we develop this work, hopefully across the, uh, certainly across the Anglosphere, and if not across the world. Um, there are five key areas that we, we focus on. The very first one is about we need to rethink our approach to male suicide, which I'll talk about a little bit more. Um, we need to reform services, so it's not just about saying men need to get help, but it's about improving the way our services give help. We need to really listen to men, because men, anyone who's worked with men in any way, shape or form, any types of groups or therapy will tell you the myth that men don't talk is bullshit. Men do talk, you just need to know how to listen to them, how to have a conversation with them. Um, number four, to re-masculate. By that I mean to reimagine masculinity in the conversation about masculinity. And I'll talk more about that, what I mean about that, but I really think we need to reimagine how we are able to talk about masculinity and femininity in a way that both honours the strengths of masculinity and femininity, but also welcomes and celebrates diversity as well. Uh, and, and, and finally, to rally for men and boys. We need to advocate for men and boys. A lot of the, uh, the social factors that shape male suicide and put men on the path to suicide, I would contest, are social systemic factors which we need to address. And if people aren't advocating for men and boys, if men and boys don't have a voice in this conversation, then we're not going to change anything. Uh, often you'll find that people do one of those things quite well, but really I, I, I assert we need all of those things happening in conjunction to really make a, a significant difference. So um, that's the model. I'll come back to that at the end. That's, that's, that's the model that we've been developing in Australia in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, taking a more collective approach to, to challenging, um, to, ch to tackling the issue. 
and I'll pop that slide up at the end again when, we, uh, when we've gone through all the other stuff. So, first bit of comparison then, just some, just some data. Um, ah, I didn't change that slide, so that should say 16 suicides, I apologise, that should say 16 suicides a day on average in, in the UK, and 12 are male and 4 are female. Uh, and in Australia it's about half of that. Um, but in terms of the actual population rate, Australia you'll no notice there has a slightly higher uh, suicide rate than the UK. The sort of the three to one ratio is, is similar. At the moment, actually, it's, uh, the ratio is a bit higher in the UK than Australia. A few years ago, it was the other way around. Um, but the rates for both male suicide and female su suicide are higher in Australia. A couple of reasons why that might be demographically. Uh, one is that we have a very high rate of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander suicide, which obviously doesn't exist in, in, in the UK. Um, there's the, 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 the migrant communities in the UK and Australia are very different. So migrant communities tend to bring with them the suicide rate from their country of origin rather than, uh, rather than having a same, the same suicide rate as the country that they moved to. So if you think about uh, the, the large immigrant communities in, in the UK, there's a lot more immigrant communities from the non-developing world, the, the, the developing world, which tend to have a lower suicide rate. So that could be having an impact on reducing the suicide rate in the UK compared to Australia. Where in Australia, a lot of the migrant communities are, they're, they're Anglo-Celtic. So they are bringing with them their suicide rate from England, from America, from, from, from those countries. Um, and another possible factor is actually that in Australia we have a longer life expectancy than the UK and you find that older people, older men in particular, beyond 85 have a really high rate of suicide. And that seems to be predominantly linked with getting old and getting ill and something else hasn't killed you and now you've got four or five illnesses and actually then suicide becomes, a, becomes your, 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 your choice of, of ending your life. Um, so there may be other factors beyond that, but those are some, demographic, some, some key demographic um, things to consider. Those of you who know my work, I'm not an academic, but I, I, I try and bring some kind of um, academic sense to what I, what, I, what I do and draw upon academic writing. But I found that, um, for me, the model, uh, the theoretical model that works best for me is the, is the integral model, because it takes account of a broad range of approaches, whether that's <coughs> psychological or behavioral or sociological. Um, so if you don't know the, the integral framework, just very briefly, um, I'll give you a quick, quick, quick rundown. So basically, um, everything on the left side is, is what, are, what, what we can study at an individual level, and everything on the right hand side is everything that we can study at a collective level, and then you have, um, that's wrong, everything across the top is individual, everything across the bottom is collective, and the, on the left hand side we have interiors, and on the right hand side we have exterior. So for example, you have psychology inside the individual, you have biology, and biology because you study from the outside, uh, and behaviour, uh, behavioural stuff there. Over here you have cultural stuff, relational stuff, so that's the inside of the collective. On the outside of the collective you get systemic stuff like the economy and, and laws and that kind of thing. <coughs> so in terms of sex and gender, what you then have is you have a psychological gender identity, you have biological and behavioural sex differences, you have uh, cultural uh, facts as gender norms, manhood, our experience of manhood and womanhood, how we relate to each other as men, how we relate to each other as women, how men relate to women, how we relate to men. Uh, and then on the systemic side, you have gender roles and gender rules. So all of these factors are in play. So for those who uh, are very much focused on, um, on sex and gender differences being uh, biologically and psychologically determined, obviously, this stuff up here is obviously using more interest. Whereas for those who think lean more towards nurture and social conditioning, then down here. And from an individual perspective, one of the common sayings is there are moments of truth in, in, in all approaches to knowledge. And so having a framework allows us to draw on, to seek out and draw on the, the moments of truth that different approaches may, may offer us. I find this framework really useful in training people because when you're talking about gender, you don't have to get into an argument about whose view about gender is right because everyone's got a different view about gender and the people you're working with, the people whose lives you're trying to save, will also have a different view about gender. What this framework says is it doesn't really matter what your view 
is, but just be aware there are other views too. So let's not have an argument about who's right or wrong about gender, let's just accept there are lots of different ways of looking at it and be aware of where you sit in that framework and then have an awareness of where other people sit, see if you've got something you could learn from them or, or, or to understand why you completely disagree with them. So, the very simplistic view of sex differences. Men are from Mars, women are from Venus. There may be some truth in that, but I'm sure we'd all agree that it's not the whole truth. So the very egalitarian view of how difference shows up um, statistically is more like that. It's this equal bell curve is sort of spread out. So um, one of the bits of uh, research I often reference is the work of uh, Simon Baron Cohen, who uh, did the work into, um, into, into autism and looked at male typical brains and female typical brains in terms of cognition. He talks about the typical systemizing male brain and the typical empathizing female brain. But what he says is that, kind of, I don't know about this, but it's not that all men are systemizing and all women are empathizing, it shows up a bit more like that. But yeah, typically men are more systemizing, but you'll find them right over here in the empathizing side, and typically men are more, women are more empathizing, and then they, they show up right over here in the systemizing side. So you pick any individual woman there, and an individual man there, and she may be far more systemizing, far more inclined towards engineering or or maths or whatever than the than, than, than man she's standing next to. But on average, you'll get more men in the engineering world, and you get more women in the, in, in the world of people and things, and psychology, for example, uh, teaching. <laughs> Often, though, it's not as equal as that. Often, men show up with having this is just height, is something we're measuring here, but it's not, the, the bell curve is not so equal. It might be more dispersed, spread out, so you might get a longer tail. You can get in all sorts of trouble by saying that there are more male geniuses and more male idiots, but that's something that just shows up if you do um, uh, IQ uh, charts. And also sometimes you'll find that uh, you get it more like that, so it's the women have the, uh, have the long tail. I think an example of that might be for uh, uh, the hours that uh, we spend at work, for example. You'll get more women working sort of, uh, sort of like around about 30 hours and it's big spread with men, and like far more working 80 hours than most of you get, so far more uh, far more unemployed if they're actually in the, uh, in the, in the market for work. So then another way we tend to look at uh, opposites is we see them in pairs of kind of moral pairs, judgmental pairs. One is positive, one is negative. Now I haven't sort of uh, um, specified which of those are typically uh, stereotypically male or stereotypically female, but you could all look at that and work out which they are. Uh, and there are two there which are saying the male quality is positive but the female opposite is negative. And there are two there which are saying the female quality is positive and the, uh, and the male opposite is negative. Or you could look at opposites as being complementary, yin and yang. So, yeah, thinking and feeling, systemising and empathising, men being focused outwards, women being focused inwards, and so on. So none of those are presented as necessarily morally superior or better, just are simply complementary. And in reality, perhaps it's a little bit more complex. Maybe it's a mix of, 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 of those things. So, so here you might have like a, a core quality, and if you've got lots of that core quality, it's a positive, kind of a positive archetypal kind of quality. But if you have too much of it, it then becomes a negative. And if you have too little of it, well, that can be, that can be like the complementary opposite, you have too little of it. But if you have hardly any of it, that can then become a negative. So to make sense, that's sort of you know, conceptually. So to uh, give an example, the sort of masculine strength at an archetypal level is the strong hero, but too much of that muscle, he becomes the brute, the beast, the villain, the, you know, the perpetrator, the murderer. Uh, and if he steps back from his physical strength a little bit, he can become the peacemaker, but too little of that physical strength, and then you have the, uh, the coward. You can apply that to a feminine virtue, feminine virtue of nurture, great nurturing, great caring, would be the great mother. But too much of that becomes a smothering mother. I've been spending Christmas with my, my mother-in-law and my partner, and I've been observing the, 
there's a line between the great mother and the smothering mother unfold as uh, she becomes more aware that her daughter's going back to Australia. Um, and then, actually, to step back from, from being too, too, too caring, you go from, like, tender love to tough love, where you need men to detach from your, say, your child and be a little less caring, and in order to allow them to make their mistakes, to become maybe the, the, the pushy mother or to be the, uh, the ambitious uh, career mum who hands over the care to someone else. And that can be a very positive thing, though too little of the care, and then you get the stereotype of the, the cruel, evil uh, bitch or witch. And then one that's been studied, which doesn't show up that much, but it's a really interesting area, and I'd like to see more studies on this, is the difference between communion and agency. So the idea agency is that you are sort of, you know, you're, 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 self, you're self-generating, you're an individual, you take care of yourself, communion is, and you're more, you're self-focused, you're a, you're a go, you're a go-getter. Uh, and then communion is, you're more focused on others, it's about, it's about connection with others. And when you measure this, like empathy, empathizing and sympathizing, when you measure communion and agency, you get a sort of a more, more men fall into the agency category, and more, more women fall into the communion category. Now, when you look at that from a moral perspective, you kind of like go, well, you know, this masculine virtue is that selfishness is it's negative, and men need to be more like, more like this. But when they study it around looking at, um, looking at health, they find that for both men and women, having agency is a very protective factor. It, people with, with agency used to have really good health, until the point where you get hyper-agency, what they call in research unmitigated agency, the selfish git, the, uh, the stereotype. So it's all about yourself and others, and they find there's, there's often then a negative impact on, it's, it's negatively correlated with, with, it's correlated with poor health. And the same is also true of unmitigated community. So, so much care and concern for other people, but, you know, the resentful martyr, I'm, only, I'm doing it for you, I'm doing all this for you. So that complete focus on others and on yourself is also correlated with, with, with poor health. So we know that having social connection is good for health and well-being. It's certainly a protective factor in terms of, in terms of um, suicide. We know from a study in Australia which looked at 11 factors that were supposedly correlated with masculinity and looked at suicidality, a large population study, uh, using the masculine scale where it's got things like um, you're a playboy or you, you have negative attitudes towards women or you're pro-violence, that kind of stuff. Out of all the 11 categories, the only one that was correlated, only one out of 11 that was correlated with increased suicidality, was self-reliance, which is, and it's a mitigated form, this I only rely myself on no one else. And you can get a sense of why someone who is so fixated on self-reliance, that can be a positive thing if you're able to look after yourself, you have agency. But if it gets to the point where you're unable to admit that you need help or seek help, then it becomes, becomes, becomes a negative. So connection to others and, and, and agency, both very positive in terms of health and well-being, but too much of either problematic. And then here are a whole host of differences, complementary differences. And you could apply the hyper and hypo kind of approach to, to, to these two. So, Masculine and feminine process often described as outside, inner, inside. Now, the obvious version is how do we recreate ourselves as human beings? Men do it from the outside, outside. Women do it from the inside. And then some people have been positive that in terms of our psychological development, in terms of our gender identity. Well, where does a girl learn to be an adult? She learns to be an adult within the mother-child relationship because the primary carer is female. For a boy, a boy has to go outside of that mother-child relationship, become independent of the mother in order to form his masculine identity. Baron Cohen, we've talked about, systemizing, we focus on things. If you look at Myers-Briggs personality types, all 16 Myers-Briggs personality types, the eight that are associated with thinking are dominated by men, and the eight that are associated with feeling are dominated by women. Um, the feminist Carol Gilligan's work looked at moral development and made a distinction between masculine rights and feminine focus on care. Problem solving, can't spell the land, useless. <laughs> um, it's sometimes said that men tend to act out and women or girls tend to act in. 
And what's the biggest complaint in relationships that when it comes to problems, women want to talk about their feelings about the problem and then try to fix it. Stress response, it's been positive again that the fight and flight approach of understanding stress is, is, is from a great male focus to women tend to more to, to tend to befriend. Typical social roles, men can be for social status to gain respect, whereas women are more likely to <coughs> connect for social approval. These are all, you know, it's not all men, all women, but these are all pairs that are, that are, that are out there in the conversation about men and women. Gender job roles, definitely, look, eight, so some of this is like, you look at this and go, well, this is so old school, this is really traditional, this doesn't, this doesn't, this doesn't reflect men and boys living today. Well, you look at the statistics for young men and young women going to university, majority of people signing up for building courses, engineering courses, computer science courses, tech courses, 18 year olds signing up for those today, most of them are male, most of the people signing up for nursing, teaching, social work, psychology, and, uh, and doing work around beauty, optima. There's many university courses on being a beautician. Um, sexual relations, acting on, being active, initiating, um, I was quite surprised when my 15 year old daughter had her first boyfriend and I said, who, 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 who asked each other, did you ask him out or did he ask you out? She said, he asked me out, that's a boy's job. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't me that brought you up like that. Yeah. <laughs> I, was the one, I was the one buying you the boy's underpants when you were seven years old because you really wanted to try on boy's clothes and have a boy buy. Mentoring strategies. Uh, David Buss were looking at, uh, looking at sort of the preferences of men and women across dozens of, of, of nations. Uh, you get women looking more for sort of status. Uh, you get uh, men looking more for youth and beauty. That's sort of in the field of evolutionary psychology. Uh, typical parenting roles, men still fall into more being the detached provider and protector, women more the attached carer and nurturer. Of course, all these things are changing and evolving. Um, parenting styles, you find that balance between dad saying take risks and uh, mum saying take care still happens. A friend of mine once said uh, when he was starting parenting, said, what I've learned from, from my partner is that she tends to parent like this, in this I tend to parent like that. Happens. These conversations are out there in people's lives, these are people's real experiences. Derek Tan's work on, on, on linguistic style, men communicate to be independent, competitive, the direct, the report, more than women who tend more to direct conversation. Men re I've been watching this at Christmas with the family. Men report, women report. Yeah, very simplistic, but you still find these patterns around there. And I'm the psycho social process, we talked about what agency. So all those, um, all those differences are in the conversation about masculinity and femininity. You can see them as, uh, as, as, as complementary. Uh, I think as long as we see them as being um, diverse representations and not fixed differences, then actually they have something to offer in terms of our understanding of issues like why do men take their lives three times or four times more than, than women. So, uh, and then from a political perspective, some of the different, uh, and I mean political and small p in the broadest possible sense, um, <coughs> some of the different perspectives of gender <coughs> have, 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 have involved. You find most of these in different people within a society like, like, uh, like uh, the UK or Australia. Some people who generally think that we are just different uh, and that's it. Men and men, women and women, and if we just got on with our distinct roles, then society would be a better place. Women and children first, men protect, women and care. But the modernist view, well, yeah, we are, but this is like the Mars and Venus view. You know, we are, we are different, but we can learn to adapt and, and, and learn each other's language so we can function more effectively. And you can get to put out, and you can get her to stop having you, you know, all that kind of like Mars and Venus stuff. And the postmodernist view, actually, well, well, we're actually just born the same, but we're, it's all conditioning. There is no difference apart from giving birth. There's no difference. It's all conditioned. And we should deconstruct society uh, and, and celebrate diversity. Or the integral view, which I lean towards, which is, yes, we are, we are born and we are conditioned to be different and diverse. And we can adapt and we can change, both at an individual level as we go through our lives, but also together we can change society and society <coughs> evolves. And Masculinity and femininity are constantly evolving. They're evolving at an individual level through our lives as we age and have different experiences and work in different contexts. And they evolve at a collective level. Uh, you know, 
Australia has only just voted for, for, for gay, gay marriage, uh, the right of a man or a woman to marry who they want to, to express their gender in that way has only just become part of Australian culture. Something that we should be proud to have uh, put in place uh, many years sooner. Um, so we're going to look at the, the, the postmodernist, I'm calling it broadly, uh, you can call it the design, but the postmodernist uh, view of, 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 of difference, because this is probably the most dominant um, discourse in terms of policy and, and cultural conversation around, uh, around gender, certainly uh, in, uh, in the sectors that are involved in trying to prevent suicide. Um, so you have the haves and you have the have-nots, and the haves are the have-nots, um, you see that the, the men are up here, which makes it very difficult then when we try and understand well, why do men have problems, because men are up here have all the power. Uh, they're not like women. Women don't have the power, men have the power, so women have problems and men don't. It's a, it's a really basic thing to say, but if anyone who's been trying to make a difference for men and boys, advocating for men and boys, you come up very quickly against this, this, this brick wall, well, men don't have problems. Or if you're pro-men, therefore you must be anti-women, because it can only be one or the other, right? You can't be, be pro-women and girls and pro-men and boys. Surely you have to take sides. It's the red, red team or the blue team. And my position has always been that, that we need to create a world where we make a difference for men and boys in addition to women and girls, not in opposition to women and girls. But hey, guess what? Yeah, women and girls have problems in life, and men and boys have problems too. It's not either or, it's both and. Both women and girls and men and boys have problems, and a civil society, an evolving decent society, will seek to address those problems. So the postmodernist view then of how to explain from a postmodernist kind of perspective how men do have problems because the data is, is, is there. So you have the, the hegemonic perspective of uh, masculinity and there are three types of masculinity basically. There's the hegemonic, all-powerful, repressing um, form of masculinity. There are those who are marginalised. These men have problems. You often come up against this. Well, the problems that you're talking about, suicide and, and, and homelessness and and struggling with education, they're not men's problems, they're problems of poverty. You see, if you're marginalised, you're poor, you're being an LGBTI, you're, 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 uh, you're dis dis disabled in some way, um, yeah, yeah, you have problems. But you, you, you rest of them, they're not men's problems, they're problems of poverty. And you're either, you're either in power, marginalised, or you're complicit with the, the power structure. So you either So you either actually are the problem, or you have a problem, but you don't have a problem because you're a man or a boy. You have a problem because you have some other identity. Which isn't backed up, though, and if you look at data, if you look at the data for male suicide, yeah, sure, if you are down here in some way, you will have a higher rate of suicide. The obsession of BME doesn't, uh, doesn't show up in uh, one of the few social indicators, which isn't worse if you're black and minority and ethnic suicide. Um, yeah, sure, you've got problems. And you're more likely to suicide than the guy up here at the top of the, the social ladder. But if you're at the top of the social ladder and you're a guy, you're still three times more likely to suicide than a woman at the top of the social ladder. So that difference between men and women, it runs right up the pyramid, not just down here. And that's again true of all social issues. It's true of life expectancy, or issues around education, or vulnerability to, to different types of violence. So, uh, my, my assertion is part of the challenge we face in terms of trying to address the social issues of men and boys, such as male suicide, is that the dominant discourse around gender and gender issues isn't supportive of us making, making a difference. Uh, and you can see that there's, there's a kind of archetypal base to this. So if you look at the uh, if you look at the yellow the yellow column, there are, those are some of those sort of those complementary archetypal pairings that uh, the, I talked about a few slides ago. So for example, second one down, independence and agency is complemented by intimacy and, and communion. But if we only apply the kind of the moral judgmental thinking to that, then you get a different perspective. So you get that kind of, if you remember that slide I was saying about the, the, the archetype and the negative stereotype, 
If you look at the archetype and then only see the negative stereotype, if you only see the dark side of the masculine archetype and the light side of the feminine archetype, then you get a very sort of narrow view of, of the world. So if you take the independence and, uh, and the communion, the intimacy, you then get, what you see is men being selfish and women being selfless and serving others. And you can run this right down, right down, right down the column. And if you turn that in then into, into our, the gender narrative, what you get, well, it's, it's a man's world. And these are all kind of, these statements are all statements you come, come across over and over again if you go out and Lord advocating for men and boys. It's a man's world. Men don't have social problems. Men don't need help. Men are the problem. And in terms of suicide, suicide happens because men don't talk, because men don't get help, and because masculinity is, is toxic. And none of that honours and recognises the, 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 the archetypes in the yellow column. Which means that if you, you can say all those things, but if you then actually go out in the world and try and actually prevent male suicide from that perspective, you will struggle. And as I've gone around Australia, as I've worked with men and boys and, and gathered, the reason I've run conferences and seminars is to bring together examples of good practice, to hear people who are really good at a grassroots level at helping and making a difference for men and boys. And you very rarely find those people who are actually doing the helping and making the difference are focused on this version of what's happening for men and women. They're more focused on this. They recognize the strengths in men and they work with those strengths to make a difference. <laughs> and the same has been proven true for me again, being in Australia, going around Australia, finding great projects that are working with men of different backgrounds, with different social issues, they make a difference because they're focused on that. They don't, they don't come to those seminars and complain that men don't talk and men don't get help. They tell you stories about how they help men and how the men open up and talk to them. <laughs> so looking at my integral view to gender issues is that it acknowledges both difference and diversity. It's not fixated on men and women are different or men and women are just diverse and there's no difference whatsoever. It acknowledges both, it acknowledges the role of nature and nurture, but it actually deals functionally with the world the way it is right now, particularly for the individuals you're trying to make a difference for. How is the world for them right now? What is that man's lived experience? We don't hear much about men's lived experience, but if you talk about addressing male suicide, we need to get interested in what men's experience is rather than telling them what they're experiencing it is a more problem. If only your masculinity wasn't so toxic, you wouldn't want to kill yourself, said no one who effectively prevented someone from, from killing themselves. But it also recognises a development view at both an individual and collective level. The people grow and evolve. We're not fixed. It's not like saying, no, but men are men, that's fine. They should just stay the way they are. No, people grow and evolve and develop. It's understanding where are they on the developmental path and how can we help them right now from the position they are on the path to meet them where they are right now. And it's, yes, it's aware of the strengths and weaknesses of what you might call masculinity and, and femininity. We're not fixated on it, just has an awareness of it and uses it when it works. And it is also acutely aware of the way that gender politics can both help and both hinder us in seeking to make a difference. So, back to suicide then. We saw that slide. This is a reminder of what we're looking at. And I'm going to look now at some of the differences in between the UK and Australia. So there's just a reminder. Very similar in terms of male to female rates, but slightly higher rates in Australia. And I'm, in this talk, I'm not going to talk about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, suicide. I do a lot of work with men working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander men, but it's not relevant to the UK context, so I'll save that for a little bit. <coughs> and in truth, I do a lot of work with, with people who, with, with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander men who run groups for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, other Aboriginal men. I don't do the work with Aboriginal. There's some um, interesting differences in terms of age. They're not, they're not directly comparable, unfortunately. But um, the, the key ones are is, 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 the, is the peak for suicide is, is, is in both countries now. It used to be young men, but that's, that's, uh, that's fading away a little. Uh, and the peak more now is in middle age. Except for with Australia, we have this peak here. Older men. Now that's just the rate. In terms of the numbers, the numbers are actually quite small because the number of men of that age is small. So in terms of the numbers, the vast majority, there's, there's three groups to be aware of as far as I'm concerned. Young men is concerned because it's the leading killer of young men. 
because there aren't so many other things that young men get killed by. So suicide is the leading killer of young men. For middle-aged men, they are the largest, they're the largest chunk of, of, of suicide, middle-aged men. And then for older men, the rate is now, in Australia particularly, the rate is higher. So all three age groups are, are of concern for different reasons. I'd be interested to see whether that sort of that pattern with older men continues. You see a slight increase there. So it seems to be like, like, like life gets worse as you go through it, and then you approach retirement, and you get this kind of like dipping off. It's like, oh, I'm going to retire now. That's okay. And you get, you get a bit of respite the first few years of retirement, and then people go, shit, retirement shit, and then kind of like it gets worse again. <laughs> so that's kind of like, so that that pat, that pattern you see in the UK and Australia, it's just, it's just more, it's just more marked that 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 uptick with old age. And like I said, part of it, I think, is because part of it, I think, is because life expectancy is longer. Because most of those suicides are linked to physical illness, not mental illness. Right, this is the, so how is the su male suicide, so this is a really confused one, we'll just look at this one here, right? People often talk about, you know, oh, dramatic terms, it, the, 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 it's, it's exploding the male suicide rate. Do you know the interesting thing? Uh, the farms I could go back in Australia, was in 1880, I found the suicide rate was 17.5. Australia was so small, that was something like 200 suicides. This graph, 1964, so 17.5 would be around there, 20 per 100,000. So this it goes up above 20, comes back down again, it's currently about 18. It's hardly moved, it goes up and down, but it's hardly moved. 18 per 100,000, it's hardly moved where, since where, from where it was in 1880. And very similarly, in the UK, it was 20 in 1863. It's been up and down, and it has started to fall away faster in the UK. It's around about 16 now. So again, it's hardly moved over time. It's been peaks and troughs, but it's hardly moved over time. And it's certainly not exploding in the way that some advocates would claim. However, compared to other causes of death, which we're managing to tackle and bring down, it's stubborn. So it's become more of a concern. I think it's a really positive thing that we actually become, we are becoming more concerned about the issue of male suicide and female suicide as well, of course. So as I've sort of talked to different people and, their, and, and observed their approaches to suicide prevention, what I started to notice was there was two distinct patterns. There was the mainstream sort of model of suicide prevention, and then there was the kind of model that un unknowingly people who are really good at working with men in small groups and small communities seem to, they seem to have the same model but it was different from the mainstream model. So the mainstream model I call the inside out. So we've got the inside out and the outside in. Going right back to that idea of the masculine and feminine process. The inside out and the outside in models of suicide prevention. Now mod no model is, 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 the, is the entire truth but models are really useful for helping us to make sense of things and design interventions. So the inside out model tends to go that this is how people end up suicide and this is what they'll teach you in suicide prevention training. So first they have sort of thoughts and feelings of suicide, so it's internal, then they may sort of plan or attempt suicide and then some people who attempt suicide then go on to, com to complete suicide. And therefore if we want to prevent suicide, we need to intervene at some point. If we can intervene somewhere along that pathway, we can prevent people from, from killing themselves. Now that's fantastic and it does work. The issue is, is that that seems to work really well with three different groups of people. One, people who have mental health issues that are linked to suicidality. Two, people who express suicidality, they express their thoughts and feelings or report their thoughts and feelings of suicide. And, and, and people who attempt suicide. Now this is the gender suicide paradox is that women have more mental, are reported, more mental health issues than men, more suicidality than men, make more suicide attempts than men. So it should be no wonder, really, that when the majority of people who fit into that model are, are female, this model, this approach, is more effective at helping men, among people, helping women than helping men. And when people have actually researched suicide prevention strategies to find out how effective they are, they consistently find that Suicide prevention strategies all over the world are more effective at reaching women than they are at reaching men. Now, we could say, well, that's men's fault. And some people do. If only men were different and had experienced their suicidality like women did, then they'd fit inside our model. So we've got this great model, we just need to change men to fit them into the model, and then we can save their lives. That's one way of thinking about it. 